for us and welcome to the very first uh, official event for homecoming uh, this fall at uh, Carson Newman. We are so delighted uh, to have such a, a beautiful day today and to come together for such an important event in the life of this school. Founders Day at Carson Newman and at colleges and universities all across our, our country they are very significant days in the life of their uh, institutions as you not only honor those who have planted trees from which we draw shade and enjoy fruit uh, that went before us, but we remember the, the distinctiveness and celebrate the, the wonderful events that have taken place on this campus. And today, uh, having Dr. Kitty Coffey as our um, honoree is just a day for which I am most grateful. I have uh, enjoyed getting to know her uh, since coming, and I tell you, she is a gift to this community, and uh, her imprint is uh, all over this campus. She is loved and respected by all who know her, and I am so grateful this morning to not only to welcome you to Founders Day Chapel, but to welcome Dr. Coffey and all of her family and guest with us today. I'd like to open us with a word of prayer if I could, and we'll continue uh, with our program. Gracious Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to gather for worship. And uh, today, as we uh, honor the, the great history of this school that you planted you have preserved, and you continue to bless today. I pray a blessing over Dr. Kitty Coffey uh, and her family. I thank you for her legacy and for her faithfulness and for the thousands of lives that she has touched through her leadership and service through this school. Father, we bless each person who is here and I ask that as we go through this chapel service this morning, that you will speak to us, that our hearts will be encouraged and inspired, and we bless you in Jesus' name, amen. There are many things that can transport us directly to a place in our memories. Here at Carson Newman, those might be, include the university hymn, maple trees in the fall, a favorite professor, a phenomenal leader. Our Founders Day speaker, Dr. Kitty Roberts Coffey, is a person who evokes memories of Carson Newman as we reflect on her legacy at this institution. Dr. Coffey is the daughter of William Oliver Roberts and Verdi Cluck Roberts, both educators and her greatest supporters. Mrs. Roberts is an alumna of Carson Newman, as are Dr. Coffey's sister, her two nieces, and her nephew. So her connection to Carson Newman is long, deeply rooted, and continuing. Dr. Coffey is an alumnus of the University of Tennessee three times over, having graduated magna cum laude with a Bachelor of Science degree in food science, earning a master's degree in food science with a minor in nutrition, and completing a PhD in sociocultural food science. She is married to Dr. Benjamin Coffey, an orthodontist in private practice in Morristown, Tennessee, and they recently celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. Dr. Coffey retired from Carson Newman University and the Department of Family and Consumer Sciences in May 2019, culminating a 53-year career in higher education, 42 of which were here at Carson Newman. She is the longest-serving chair of Family and Consumer Sciences, having led the department for 39 years and also served as dean for 25 years. During her time at Carson Newman, Dr. Coffey created a vital advisory board that has operated continuously since 1981, fundraising for remodeling the former Jefferson County Hospital into the current Child Development Laboratory and for building Bly Petite Hall, which was, at the time it opened in 2007, the first new academic building on campus in 25 years. Dr. Coffey directed the didactic program in nutrition and dietetics from its inception until 1979, until August 1st of this year. She, is, she led the program to an, earn accreditation from the American Association of Home Economics in 1985. 
The Carson Newman University Department of Family and Consumer Sciences was the first Southern Baptist college or university to be accredited. Currently, we at Carson Newman hold the distinction of being the only Southern Baptist University and the only private institution in the nation to hold this standard of excellence, a tribute to the visionary leadership of Dr. Coffey provided during her tenure at Carson Newman. Dr. Coffey has re represented Carson Newman locally, regionally, and nationally through publications, invited presentations, and in leadership roles in various professional organizations. She has received numerable awards, including the Carson Newman Distinguished Faculty Award, the highest award given to faculty in recognition by peers, students, administration, and alumni as an outstanding teacher and mentor. Other recognitions and awards include three different 50-year honor awards from professional organizations, Leader in Family and Consumer Sciences, American Dietetic Association, excuse me, Medallion Award, three Outstanding Dietetic Educator Awards, the University of Tennessee Knoxville College of Human Ecology Centennial Leader, Carson Newman Association of Family and Consumer Sciences Lifetime Achievement Award, Carson Newman Creativity Award, two leader awards from professional organizations, and two awards for outstanding dietitian. Dr. Coffey's service to the university has been vast, serving on the commencement steering committee, the administrative planning committee, and the campus strategic planning committee. Her considerable administrative skills were beneficial as she served on the steering committee of the SAC COC Institutional Self-Study for Reaffirmation of Accreditation from 1981 to 1982, and then as director and chair of the steering committee for the SAC COC Self-Study Reaffirmation of Accreditation from 1991 to 1993. Known for her personal charm and grace, she was a natural fit as chair of the hospitality committee for the SACS COC site visit in 2003 and as chair of the hospitality and logistics committee for the site visit in 2013. Dr. Coffey has perhaps had some of the greatest influence on the vision and direction of Carson Newman in the past 20 years as she served on four campus-wide search committees as chair of the provost advisory search committee in 1996, the presidential search committee in 1999, member and secretary of the 2008-2009 Presidential Search Committee and on the Interim Presidential Search Committee in 2018. In 2009, Dr. Coffey used her considerable gifts and talents in co-chairing the Presidential Inaugural Committee. Retirement has not diminished Dr. Coffey's service to the university as she is currently the co-chair of the 2019 Presidential Inaugural Committee. The university mission is a way of life for Dr. Coffey. She has dedicated her career to serving others, to developing students, faculty, and colleagues, to helping people reach their full potential as servant leaders. Thank you, Dr. Coffey, for your leadership, your mentorship, and your friendship. We look forward to hearing your address. What an unexpected honor and privilege it is to stand before you today. In this church, on this Founders Day 2019, as we celebrate our beloved Carson Newman University. I must admit, students that I wish I had paid much more attention to previous Founders Day celebrations. I wish I had even taken notes, as I usually do when I attend conferences on my subject matter areas. Had I only known that one day I would stand here before you to speak on behalf of thousands of deserving people to be here today before you. I am honored to be representing them. I want you to know, though, that I do have one vivid recollection of a Founders Day that, without any notes, I can share with you. 
Now, I did look up the date. It was October the 23rd, 2014, five years ago. The speakers were Richard and Patricia Ashley Wallace. Mrs. Wallace, an alum known as Patsy, was a member of the Board of Trustees at that time. I clearly remember Ms. Wallace saying to the students that she wanted you to remember that particular Founders Day. Then she and her husband proceeded to make good on their promise. That fall, I was teaching LA 101, and I had accompanied the students to this Founders Day chapel. Upon arrival, I noted that the Wallaces were at the doors to the sanctuary, greeting the students as they came in. As it turns out, the Wallaces were choosing a student for each of three categories. Early arrivals, on-time arrivals, and late arrivals. <laughs> Each of the three students was given an envelope, sealed, ask not to open it until called upon. Then the Wallaces asked the student who arrived early to please come forward. The student was asked to open the envelope. It contained $163 in cash a reward for exceeding the expectation of arriving on time. But why 163? The age of Carson Newman in 2014. Then the next envelope was opened by the student who had arrived on time. Again, $163 in cash. And finally, the student who had arrived late, but not too late to be granted entry. This student happened to be in my LA 101 class, <laughs> sitting on the same pew with me. She was frightened. I was anxious. The class, we sat on the edge of our seats. She went to the pulpit. She opened the envelope. And guess what? $163 in cash. The audience applauded. A reward for coming to 2014 Founders Day, even if late. As Alex Haley, author of Roots, was fond of saying, find the good and praise it. So if my Founders Day is less than memorable, I hope that you will remember that I shared with you a Founders Day that I remembered that was memorable. <laughs> According to Isaac Newton Carr, interim president of Carson Newman in 1948, Founders Day was approved in 1947 by the faculty and board of trustees of Carson Newman. The event was to be held annually on March 7th or near so, which is the birthday of William C. Newman, one of the eight original founders of Mossy Creek Missionary Baptist, the origin of, of Carson Newman University. And it was a day to be recognized and celebrated by both faculty and students. The first recorded Founders Day was March the 10th, 1948. Since 1992, Founders Day has been held continuously in mid to late October on each November. There's one exception, September 11, 2001, now known as the infamous 9-11. Carson Newman was celebrating the sesquicentennial or 150th anniversary of its founding in 1851. Dr. James Netherton, the college's 21st president, was speaker for this special Founders Day. As faculty assembled outside the church around 9.15 a.m., word spread up the line that a plane had struck 
one of the Twin Towers in New York City. Now, as a footnote, in 2001, not everyone owned a cell phone or carried one. There was no campus or state a national emergency alert system. People used television and radio for that. During the ceremony, Dr. Netherton was handed a note, and the note indicated that the second tower had been hit. Dr. Netherton, having made the announcement, then led the shocked assembly here in this room in prayer. I distinctly remember his calm and eloquent prayer, praying not only for us and our nation, but for the perpetrators. And I clearly remember feeling so grateful to be here in this place at that time of national crisis and fear. Now to my recollections of my connection to Carson Newman. Now to avoid any misunderstanding of those of you who might and should have been at convocation and heard our President Fowler speak of the founding of Carson Newman, I was not among the original founders. <laughs> In fact, I didn't arrive here to the 126th year of Carson Newman. Even so, as Dr. Whaley pointed out, you might do the math and that accounts for one-fourth of the history of Carson Newman. And I'm trying not let, to let that make me feel old. <laughs> However, I really began to connect with Carson Newman in its centennial year, which it would have been 1951. Actually, you could say I have known of Carson Newman since my birth, in that I was delivered, born in Carson Newman, delivered by a local physician and prominent surgeon, Dr. R. M. McCowan, who in Dr. Carr's history of Carson Newman is quoted as devoted Carson Newman alum and unpaid CN football coach. Although both my husband and Ben and I are graduates of the University of Tennessee, I grew up knowing Carson Newman. Living only 10 miles away in West Hamblin County, we, my sister and I, knew of Carson Newman through our mother. Later, I would know Carson Newman through the stories of my nephew and two nieces, one of which, uh, uh, nephew and one niece are here today. Our mother attended Carson Newman in the early 1930s, as you know of the Great Depression. She left after her freshman year to start teaching in a county school in Jefferson. During the school week, mother shared a room in the community house where she was teaching with Billy Manley. Billy Manley was a sister of Kathleen Manley for whom the infirmary was named and dedicated in 1961. Kathleen Manley was a noted nurse missionary to Nigeria. Mother would then return home during the summers and take more courses at Carson Newman. By 1938, she had completed her junior year. In 1940, our mother and father married. Our father at the time was a public school teacher and a principal in the same school where mother taught the lower grades. About Mark Carson Newman, mother often spoke of home economics classes, bringing food from the farm to the food preparation classes. Now, Dr. Whaley, that really was farm to table. <laughs> the town girls brought money to purchase the textiles for the peril construction class, Dr. Roth. Now, that's lab fees, if you will. <laughs> mother also spoke of her faculty in the education department, particularly after she returned to public school teaching. As a commuter, mother spent only one night on campus. That was in Sarah Swan door. The next day she decided she'd rather live at home and ride the 
a train twice daily to and fro to Carson Newman. I wonder how Mother got to know her president being a trans student and also because that she was here so little. But of course, there was always child. Mother's president was Warren, Dr. Warren, Dr. James T. Warren. He served Carson Newman as its 17th president, September 1927 to January 1948. His 20-year term as Carson Newman's president was during one of the most difficult periods in our nation's history, the Great Depression and World War II. Today I share with you Dr. Warren's presidency. Dr. Warren was born in Corinth, Mississippi, as was our 23rd president, Dr. James A. Fowler. The Warren family moved to West Tennessee, and James, the oldest of the 10 children, attended high school in Wheatley County, then taught school for two years, and borrowed more money to go to Hall Moody Junior College in Martin, Tennessee. He later earned both the BS and MA, MA degrees from Peabody College. In 1929, the honorary doctorate of laws and letters was bestowed on President Warren by Georgetown College. On May 26, 1927, by unanimous approval of the Board of Trustees, James T. Warren was elected president of Carson Newman College and paid an annual salary of $4,200. President Warren's major accomplishments over his tenure, tenure are described by librarians Linda Gass and Al Lang in their 2012 history of Carson Newman as the following. The college's name officially became Carson Newman hyphen, hyphen in the middle. The science building was completed in 1939 and then later after Dr. Warren's death in 1959 named in his honor. The Fighting Parsons, and there's a great story there if you want to go read about it, became the Fighting Eagles. World War II Several hundred naval men lived in Saraswan Hall and Blank Doug's Hall, which no longer exist. They were engaged in pre-officer training as part of a Carson Newman contract with the government. Other achievements noted are the college was approved for membership in the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools on December the 1st, 1927, and Carson Newman's president became noted for initiating the practice of basing salary upon faculty rank, experience, and tenure. Heretofore, men had been paid higher than women. And although not a minister, President Warren was an active Baptist layman who spoke frequently to Baptist groups congregations, association meetings, and a variety of other religious assemblies. During the Great Depression, President Warren and his treasurer saved the college's endowment by not cashing in at the deflated prices. Instead, the college bought property in Knoxville, paid the taxes, kept up the repairs, and profited by collecting the rents, holding until prices regained and the college could sell their properties without losing, they were able to sustain a loss, no loss in the endowment. Perhaps no greater service was ever rendered Carson Newman, wrote Isaac Newton Carr, interim president, as he followed President Warren after his death. But because of the Great Depression and World War II, it was necessary to put building projects on hold. So Dr. Warren saw only the purchase of the president's home in 1946 and the building of the then science building in 1939. 
But the stresses of the Depression and World War II had taken its toll on President Warren. His hearing began to become impaired and he felt quite tired. On January the 2nd, 1948, he tendered his resignation at a called meeting of the full board of trustees. The resignation to be effective July the 31st, 1948. Subsequently, Dr. Warren announced to the faculty that he was approaching a hospitalization about which he was not optimistic. A surgery was performed in a Knoxville hospital by an eminent surgeon. President Warren was found to have a malignancy in advanced stage. Dr. James Thomas Warren, Carson Newman's 17th president, died on January the 16th, 1948, at age 63. His funeral was conducted here at First Baptist Church, Jefferson City, and he was buried in Westview Cemetery. His wife, who died April the 30th, 1961, is buried beside him. A resolution passed by the faculty following his death expressed appreciation from the faculty for the following. Raising academic standards, thereby obtaining and maintaining SACS accreditation. Providing strong financial leadership during the Depression. Keeping the college solvent while meeting all obligations, including prompt payment of salaries to all faculty members and staff. Expression, and I quote, of contagious enthusiasm for Christian higher education, which evoked responses from individuals, churches, and associations, sufficient to double the assets of the college, end quote. Then the minutes of the Board of Trustees read in part, and I quote, in his relations to faculty and staff, students and friends, he was found to be a man of integrity, firmness, sound judgment, genuine human sympathy, and practical kindliness. An editorial in a noted newspaper in Tennessee stated, Carson Newman lost a great president and Tennessee lost a great citizen. Now, I understand why my mother revered President James T. Warren. It's taken me 42 years and having to find a topic for today to bring me to this understanding that I share with you today. What is your Carson Newman history? What will you tell your children and your grandchildren about Carson Newman? Much of the history of an institution such as Carson Newman's is our own personal history. Our relationships and our experiences that have we have had during our time here. What will yours be? This will be my fourth presidential inauguration. There are others here who will remember the fifth, and that would be Dr. John A. Fincher in 1968. If you remember a sixth, it would be Dr. Harley Fights, Fight Administration Building, in 1948. Each day, we are witnesses to history. We are at a historic moment in Carson Newman's history as we inaugurate our 23rd president in just two weeks. Let us embrace this momentous occasion which forever shall be recorded in the Carson Newman history annals. And you make stories and you tell those stories to the next generation. 
May God bless each of you here today. And may God continue to bless our beloved Carson Newman University. Thank you for this opportunity to celebrate with you this Founders Day 2019. Let us pray. Oh, beloved Christ, benediction means good word. And we have certainly heard the good word through your daughter, our beloved colleague and friend, Dr. Kitty Coffey. Lord, she is so correct that we stand today, indeed, every day, at a turning point of history. Oh, beloved God, we stand here as Carson Newman community, thanking you that 168 years ago, some people had a vision. Thank you for birthing that vision, for we know that it is by your power and power alone that we, Carson Newman, were created. And it is by your grace that we have been kept across this 168 years through the efforts, the investment of so many, dug the wells from which we drink, who invested in lives that made Carson Newman, Carson Newman, for those we give thanks. But as we get ready to depart, as disciples, as we seek to build the future, we ask, Lord, do it again. Grant us the wisdom to realize the preciousness, not just of this place, and its history, but of its people and our history. Grant us all, especially our beloved students, the foolishness to believe that with vision and hard work and obedience to your claim upon our lives as exemplified especially in Dr. Coffey's ministry here that with vision and obedience you can do exceedingly abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine. Now to him who by the power at work within us will make it so be honor and glory now and forevermore. Amen.